Our bodies are constantly changing. From the time we are born to the time that we die, our bodies go through several different stages of development. And as we progress through these stages of development, our body changes tremendously. In accordance with that, our nutritional needs also change greatly as well. In this video, we're going to look at how the nutritional requirements from a newborn, for example, differ from that of an adult, and how from a, the, the nutritional requirements of a young adult are different from somebody that's reached old age. So stay tuned while we learn about how our nutrition changes over time. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Our nutritional needs are constantly changing throughout our lifespan. The nutritional needs of an infant, for example, are significantly different from those of a teenager. And those of a teenager are significantly different than someone who has reached middle age. So in this video, what we're going, to, we're going to talk about is the different developmental stages that we go through as human beings and how our nutrition uh, varies as we progress throughout those stages and how those nutritional requirements are reflective of the changes that our bodies are undergoing during those different times in our development. So let's start at the beginning. Maybe we start before the beginning, actually. Let's start uh, with what's going on when a baby is in the womb. So we'll actually start with talking about what, it, what nutritional needs a pregnant woman has. Because when a baby is still in the womb, that baby is entirely dependent on its mom for its nutritional resources. They're going to be shared with the baby uh, through the placenta. So what mom eats, what, what nutrients she consumes, what macronutrients, what micronutrients she consumes are directly impacting the nutrition that that baby is receiving. So as I said, uh, the fetus is entirely dependent upon the mother for its nutritional needs. And as such, if women are considering getting pregnant, they should be trying to, uh, to act and eat in ways that would be in accordance with the way they would want to eat when they are pregnant. Of course, once a woman does become pregnant, um, she is going to start gaining weight. And it's important that she does. And the reason why is that a lot of changes are going to be happening within her body. And as, and, and as such, she's also eating for two. What that means is she needs to make sure that she has a very high quality diet in terms of getting the proper amount of vitamins and minerals, as well as the proper macronutrients in her diet to make sure that she's providing ample energy and nutrition for herself, as well as the baby that is growing inside of her. So a woman who is pregnant is going to begin gaining weight, and that's an important thing. Uh, women who don't gain enough weight during pregnancy actually are at risk for uh, preterm delivery, as well as perhaps having uh, resulting in a baby who is born either malnourished, they could have developmental disabilities, or physical impairments as the direct result of not consuming a proper uh, amount of macro or micronutrients um, during the pregnancy process. Women should also be careful not to gain too much weight because um, gaining too much weight during the pregnancy can uh, also be a risk factor uh, for the mother as well as the baby um, because it can lead to things like high blood pressure or gestational diabetes um, uh, in some cases if um, women are getting improper amounts of nutrition or gaining too much weight. So how much weight should a woman gain during pregnancy? Well, the answer is it depends. It's dependent on, on, on how big the woman is, um, how much she weighs prior to being pregnant, um, and lots of other criteria. So for example, women who uh, have a very low BMI who are underweight uh, will need to gain significantly more weight during the, pregnancy, during the pregnancy than a woman who is at a normal BMI. Uh, and a woman who is at a high BMI, i.e. is considered to be overweight or obese prior to being pregnant, may need to gain slightly less weight. The idea is to try to stay within um, proper nutritional guidelines during that process. So where is this weight going to be gained and, and where, is it, where is this added weight going to come from? Well, um, during the first trimester or so, women are going to gain somewhere around, so should gain somewhere around six to eight pounds. Um, and then after you reach the second trimester, it's really about a pound a week for the remainder of the pregnancy. Again, that's a ballpark figure and a lot of that depends on um, the depends on the height and the weight uh, of, of the mother um, who is pregnant. Now, where is all that weight going? Well, six to eight pounds are just going to go to the fetus. The baby itself actually weighs um, somewhere between six and ten pounds. So you're going to gain weight uh, right there just from the fact that the baby is going to be growing inside of you for somewhere between 38 and 40 weeks if the pregnancy goes full term. 
There's also going to be an increase in the blood volume and the bodily fluids that's going to increase uh, the weight of the mother by about two or three pounds each. The placenta, the uterus, the amniotic sac, um, and an increase in breast size are all going to contribute between, uh, between two and three pounds each uh, throughout the pregnancy as these begin to increase in size. And then women are going to typically gain somewhere between eight and 10 pounds of maternal fat stores. And these fat stores are going to be hugely important um, both for uh, uh, both for providing um, energy during the pregnancy, but also providing energy and a source of, of, of raw materials that are needed for breast milk um, when women are lactating and breastfeeding if they choose to do so um, following the delivery of the baby. So what happens after the baby's born? Well, a lot of that weight is going to be lost fairly rapidly. Some of it's going to happen just right after birth. So, um, you know, obviously the baby's going to, uh, the baby will no longer be inside. So there's, you know, the baby weight that's already gone in terms of the weight of the fetus, which is now the baby. Um, you're going to lose uh, the weight from the placenta because that's going to be passed. There's also going to be a significant amount of fluid loss that's going to occur during that process. And some of the weight's going to come off. Over time, the blood volume is going to return to normal. It actually goes up by upwards of 50% during the pregnancy process, and other bodily fluids uh, will also return to normal levels. Um, so there's going to be some of that weight loss right there. There's also some evidence that suggests that breastfeeding can um, more easily allow women to return to their pre-pregnancy uh, pre weight, although uh, there is some studies that say that there isn't an effect. Um, so that data is a little bit controversial. Um, and there is also some evidence that suggests that women who are um, active during pregnancy also tend to lose the weight a little bit faster following pregnancy than women who have a more sedentary lifestyle um, while they are pregnant. Women who are pregnant are obviously going to need to have a different diet than women who are not. Uh, throughout the first trimester, nothing much changes except for the fact that they should be getting um, an increased dosage of some of the key vitamins and minerals. Uh, one of the things that can help with that, um, many women take prenatal vitamins to ensure that they're getting the proper amount of many of these essential vitamins and minerals in their diet. Um, they're also going to need to get some increased caloric intake, typically during the second and the third trimester is where this is most important. Uh, during the second trimester, uh, women can typically tack on somewhere around 350 extra calories um, for each of the weeks of the second trimester, or for each day, I should say, um, during the weeks of the second trimester. And then in the third trimester, maybe an extra 450 calories are needed um, because the baby's getting bigger inside of the womb and is going to require more and more nutrition uh, to uh, continue to grow and develop at the right pace. The big thing during the during uh, pregnancy uh, when eating is making sure that you're eating a, uh, a diverse uh, a diverse diet, hopefully one that is uh, nutrient dense, trying to stay away from some of those um, high sugar foods and things like that. Although, um, you know, one of the things that can affect that is some women who are pregnant have cravings, um, which uh, which really cause them to focus mainly on specific foods that they uh, seem to crave more than others. They can also have aversions. Um, so um, some women are physically unable to consume things that were part of their normal diet on a regular basis. Um, sometimes these go away after pregnancy and sometimes they don't. Um, so uh, sometimes pregnancy can permanently affect a, a woman's diet uh, depending on um, you know, how strong those aversions or those cravings can actually be. Pregnant women are also going to need to have an increase in the amount of fluids they're taking in. Somewhere around uh, two and a half liters of fluid on a regular basis is not uncommon for a pregnant woman to need uh, throughout her pregnancy. The reason why, as I said before, her blood volume is now going to go up by upwards of 50%. Um, so it's going to become much more easy to become dehydrated. She's also sharing um, those fluids with the fetus who is growing and developing and is consuming a lot of energy and fluids of their own right. There's also some things that women should avoid. So obviously, um, alcohol and uh, and tobacco are sort of right out. Um, they should not be consumed not be consumed during pregnancy. Alcohol, uh, consuming any amount of alcohol is generally considered to be unsafe, or is at least not recommended. Consuming too much alcohol while pregnant can lead to something called fetal alcohol syndrome. So fetal alcohol syndrome could lead to physical and developmental uh, mental disabilities um, in the in uh, the fetus uh, who is exposed to too much alcohol. Um, smoking while pregnant can lead to a host of other health related problems, including low birth rate, uh, low birth, low birth weight or premature birth. So that should be avoided as well. Um, 
Other foods or other things that really need to be, we need to be worried about is avoiding undercooked foods. So undercooked meats in general are highly problematic. Um, this could expose women and potentially the fetus to harmful bacterial uh, species that can cause food poisoning in mom, but also can have some uh, profound effects on the um, on the fetus uh, if uh, if a mother does get it, and that could lead to a host of other uh, problems with the pregnancy if a woman is exposed to that. So as a result, women are generally pregnant. Women are generally recommended not to consume any type of um, of undercooked meat, whether it's uh, you know steak or hamburger meat or or chicken, uh, to be very careful around that. There's also certain foods that they should avoid because they contain dangerous amounts of heavy metals. So uh, a lot of these are going to come from the ocean. Uh, so um, certain fish species, things like swordfish, um, salmon, uh, tilefish, shark, things like this, these big uh, predatory fish, um, there's something called bioaccumulation. And what these species tend to accumulate inside of them is something called methylmercury. And exposure to too much mercury uh, by the mother could uh, have a, have um, some profound effects, uh, negative effects on the fetus developing inside of her. So they're generally recommended not to eat a lot of these. Sushi is completely out. That is an undercooked meat um, because it's raw. And while it's generally considered safe um, for people who aren't pregnant, the risk is just too high that, a, that something could happen and cause um, cause a sickness in, in the woman if they were to eat uh, improperly prepared sushi. So pregnant women are generally uh, asked to avoid uh, sushi as well. So once the baby's born, we've reached the first developmental stage of its life. And from now on, we'll be talking about uh, the growing individual um, after birth. This first stage is called infancy. This lasts typically somewhere between zero and 24 months um, is how it's generally assigned. Um, and for the first six months of the baby's life, it should be food, really fed nothing more than breast milk, um, infant formula, or a combination of both. Um, interestingly, in the United States, about 80% of babies begin life exclusively breastfed, um, while um, usually after the first six months or so, uh, that number has actually dropped down to about 25%. And there are a lot of reasons for this. And to be fair, um, the, the decision to breastfeed um, or not to breastfeed or do a combination really is a personal decision that a woman has to make. And there are lots of reasons uh, why women choose to do one or the other. The bottom line is if uh, the bottom line is both breastfeeding and uh, bottle feeding through formula uh, can both can both can provide the baby with adequate and essential nutrition. As a result, typically the way we consider um, what a baby should be getting um, is based is based on what the composition of breast milk is. So for infants, um, when we look at what the what their nutritional requirements are, whether it's coming from formula or from breast milk, we compare it back to breast milk. So when we look at the composition of breast milk, breast milk is somewhere between 40 and 55% carbohydrates, 10 to 20% protein, and 40 to 55% fats. So when we look at what a baby needs in terms of its diet, um, for an infant, we're trying to kind of hit those metrics. And you can see that those numbers vary quite widely. And that's because the composition of breast milk is, varies from individual to individual. But those are sort of ballparks. The one thing to realize is that infants actually have an incredibly high um, metabolic demand. Now, if you look at it in terms of raw numbers, the caloric demand is nowhere near as high as an adult. But when you look at it in terms of how much energy it actually needs on a regular basis per body weight, um, it's almost double what an adult needs. And that's fairly readily explained by just how fast an infant grows um, in the first two years of its life. It does grow a bit disproportionately. It's mostly torso and head that are gaining size. The limbs sort of lag behind a little bit. They'll catch up when we get into the toddler years to give um, toddlers a little bit more normal human proportions um, than infants have. Now, in terms of specific nutrients that babies need, um, most, most demands for specific macro and micronutrients can be met exclusively through breast, feed, breast, breast milk. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Um, so vitamin D um, typically is not something that's found in high abundance in breast milk. It might be if mom's on an exceptionally high dose of vitamin D. But for that reason, um, many babies are given a liquid vitamin D supplement. This is going to help them uh, to have proper amounts of vitamin D, but also to make sure they're taking in the appropriate amount of calcium, which is obviously going to be needed given how, many, how much their skeleton is growing over time. The other big one is vitamin K. So vitamin K is also something that does not typically... Um, 
occur in high abundance within breast milk. For that reason, some states actually have a, a law in the books that says that a baby gets an injection of vitamin K like right after they're born uh, to make sure that they have an adequate amount of this in their system. The guidelines for how long a baby should be fed uh, breast milk uh, varies. The World Health Organization says that babies uh, should be breastfed um, for at least two years uh, before being weaned off. The American Academy of Pediatrics says at least one year, although it is perfectly safe and fine to continue breastfeeding past either of those, those time periods. But around six months, what we're going to start seeing is babies are going to start being supplemented with other types of food. Um, they're going to be start start be given uh, foods that go along with the breast milk. Um, the, the big thing here and what's really important is to ensure that we're getting um, only appropriate foods. So things like baby meat, um, you know, strained vegetables, things like that. We want to avoid um, anything that's too sugary, too sweet anything. What we're trying to do is provide an additional source of micronutrients like vitamins and minerals that are needed within, uh, they're, they're needed by the baby. And what often happens is by the time the baby reaches six months of age or so, uh, breast milk alone um, isn't sufficient to provide all of the micronutrients. And by eating some of these other foods, we can get things like zinc and iron um, that are, are not going to be found in enough abundance strictly in breast milk at that point. So what about the lactating mother? Where is she going to get the energy from? Where is the milk coming from? Well, that's coming from her diet. Um, so a lot of the energy that's going to be used to produce the breast milk is actually going to come from those reserved fat stores. Remember, uh, women typically gain somewhere between 8 and 10 pounds of extra fat during pregnancy. That fat is going to start being consumed through the breastfeeding process, um, and it's going to be used to help power the, produce the energy that's needed to actually produce all this breast milk um, that's going to be fed to the infant. That is, if mother has chosen to breastfeed, um, women are also going to need women who are breastfeeding are also going to need to consume an excess amount of water. Why? Well, milk is mostly water, so um, if they're going to be putting out a significant amount of water, then they're going to need to take in enough water to make sure they're producing the proper amount of milk. The other thing to worry about is make sure um, that you're eating things that are still safe for the baby. Um, if you're taking in extra toxins, if you're taking in certain things, a lot of that is making it into the breast milk. Um, and if you're breastfeeding, then it's going to be picked up by the baby and go into his or her body as well. So as I said before, uh, whether or not to breastfeed is a woman's personal choice. There are certain benefits to breastfeeding over bottle feeding. Um, one of the major ones is that um, in a sense, breastfeeding helps to reinforce the baby's immune system. Uh, for the first several months of a baby's life, their immune system essentially uh, doesn't exist. A lot of the things that we have as adults are just now starting to come online in that infant. And one of the things that can happen is the mother can actually produce certain classes of antibodies that help to protect um, that help to protect the growing baby through the breast milk. There's a specific class of antibody called the IgA antibodies. And what can happen is that the mother can actually, um, is, is sharing the similar environment to the baby. The mom actually makes antibodies against the things that they're both coming in contact with, produces IgA antibodies, and then secretes them into the breast milk. And this helps to coat the gastrointestinal tract and the mucous membranes of the baby, and is very protective. That can actually occur through bottle feeding. Other advantages um, suggest that uh, babies that are breastfed have lower incidences of certain types of allergies, including asthma. It may also help to uh, prevent certain types of cancer in mom. And uh, there is some evidence that the increased skin-to-skin -skin contact that happens during breastfeeding helps to uh, regulate some hormones both within mom and baby and help to reinforce that maternal bond uh, that the two have. That being said, um, uh, bottle feeding offers similar nutritional advantages as breastfeeding and provides an adequate amount of nutrition. The thing about bottle feeding that's not necessarily great is that um, it's expensive. So formula is a very expensive thing, although uh, in, in many states um, and in, in, with, many, with certain insurance carriers, some of these things can be covered by insurance or are, um, are available at low or no cost uh, to mothers who um, can't afford to provide uh, proper amount or to be able to afford formula. But that being said, breastfeeding can save upwards of $1,200 a year uh, on the cost of formula. So as I said, after about six months, it's very common for babies, uh, the, the breastfeeding or the bottle feeding to be supplemented with some solid foods. Of course, this will increase over time as the baby's teeth start to come in. 
um, and they're able to eat uh, different foods. But there are some foods that, that uh, infants should never be fed. So um, infants under the age of 12 should never be given honey and they should never be given cow's milk. Um, there are certain medical risks associated with these, um, which they should be avoided. Um, they should also try to avoid um, artificial sweeteners and super sugary things, um, simply because it could impact their, it really can have a severe negative consequence on their nutrition. Um, these, these supplemental foods that, that they're given should really be things that are nutrient dense, things like fruits and vegetables. The other big thing to avoid um, is raw or partially cooked meat. So um, it's very important when you start feeding, uh, when the kids are able to uh, start being fed meat that it's properly cooked. Again, they're at much greater risk of, of severe consequences if they were to develop some type of food poisoning like E. coli or salmonella. Uh, they are much more at risk of, of, of dying or becoming very, very ill um, if they were to be exposed to uh, these these types of bacteria that are found in raw or partially cooked meat. So once we hit two years of age, from the ages of two to four, these are typically regarded as the toddler years. So at this point, most children are um, completely weaned off of breast milk, or they're they're very close to being weaned off of breast milk, and food has now become um, the predominant source of nutrition. Uh, their nutritional demands are still quite high relative to their body size, um, needing somewhere between 1,000 and 1,400 calories a day. Their limbs are going to start growing um, faster than their trunk, so they're going to start to have more of like a, an, a, like a miniature adult appearance to them as opposed to being somewhat um, disproportionate as they are usually during the first two years of life or so. Now, the other thing that's going to happen is um, in terms of their nutrition, uh, Toddlers are going to have, uh, a, they're not typically going to eat the way we do. So um, most adults in the United States eat usually three meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Toddlers typically don't eat that way. Um, it's quite often uh, easier to feed a toddler in several small meals throughout the day. The key is uh, hopefully that during these time periods, they're eating very nutrient-dense, healthy snacks throughout the day as opposed to one big meal. It's just how they operate. And the reason why is they just burn through energy so fast. Not only do they tend to be very, very active, they're now walking around, um, running around, um, and, and the like at two years old, uh, but also um, a lot's happening in their body. They're growing very quickly. Uh, one of the big things that's happening is the process of cartilage being uh, ossified into bone is starting to happen at this point. As a result, of course, calcium and vitamin D become hugely important um, during this stage of development because these are huge, these are really needed uh, for this bone formation process to actually begin. Now that we're completely free of breast milk for the most part, the proportion of macronutrients is going to change. Carbohydrates are going to be 45 to 65 percent of the diet. Protein is still around 10 to 20, but we're going to see a decrease um, in the amount of fat in the diet. And that's going to go down to about 25 to 35 percent. And this is pretty standard for throughout much of development. Uh, these relative proportions are what are being recommended. The big thing that's going to start happening in terms of what children eat is it's going to start becoming more and more dependent on their tastes at this point. So between two and four, uh, toddlers are going to begin to learn to feed themselves. Um, so they're going to want to become more independent. They're, you know, they're going to want to begin eating their own foods, choosing their own foods. They're going to sort of develop their own taste. Um, and this could be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, sometimes it can be very hard to get toddlers to eat. And they can become, they can start to have a very uh, small diet. And, and there are some ways to work around this. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that can be helpful is to try to make um, snack time, meal time fun. So try to let them help out um, in picking what foods they eat. Um, try to expose them to a wide variety of foods and keep trying them. So um, it can be very hard because kids can, uh, you know, Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, they can be very resistant to wanting to try new things, but it's important to continue to try to encourage them to consume new things so that they can have a pretty wide diet. Of course, it's perfectly acceptable to supplement with a multivitamin. Obviously, consult with your pediatrician uh, before doing so, but this can also help to assure that in addition to the foods that they're eating, that they're also getting the proper amounts of, of micronutrients uh, from a multivitamin to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're maintaining that proper nutritional balance they need to continue to grow. It's actually not a surprise once we know this that um, toddler obesity is actually becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, one of the big things that happens in this case is um, rather than uh, being exposed to eating, consuming healthier, nutrient-dense foods like fruits and vegetables, um, uh, some toddlers are 
subsisting mainly on a diet of, of basically empty carbohydrates and things like that. And the problem then is that they're not getting the proper nutritional balance, but they're also gaining a lot of weight. And what we've seen in uh, the recent couple of decades is a huge increase um, in childhood obesity, especially within this range of like two to four years old. Again, trying to get a child to eat a proper diet is challenging, but um, it's important that we, that, uh, we try to keep them uh, at a healthy weight and making sure they're getting the proper um, micro and macronutrients in their diet. Once we reach the age of four, we're now into childhood, so ages four to eight. So what's going to happen here is um, growth is going to slow down a little bit. They're still growing, and they're still growing in many different ways, but the relative amount of growth to body size has now slowed down compared to what happened in the first four years or so of life. Kids are going to be becoming more and more independent at this point. And towards the end of this, uh, once we get to like ages seven and eight, they're going to actually start losing their baby teeth and start um, and, and their adult teeth are going to start coming in. Uh, this can actually cause some problems with nutrition. Uh, one of the main reasons why is um, missing teeth uh, or um, or having teeth that come in sort of in the wrong pattern. Um, can make it very hard uh, to eat certain foods. And um, it's not uncommon for children to have to take some time away from eating certain foods because they're missing um, uh, missing some teeth. For example, my daughter, um, when she lost her first four teeth, they were her four front teeth. So she just had no front teeth for like two months. Uh, that makes it really hard to do things like tear meats apart or, or, or rip uh, bigger pieces into small. So uh, we had to adjust her diet, make sure we helped her out a little bit more in terms of you know cutting up her food smaller so that she could actually eat a little bit better. So things like that can happen. Um, kids in the ages of four to eight are going to need somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 calories on a regular basis. Again, it seems more in line with what an adult might eat, but understand relative to body size, these kids are going through a lot of energy. And that's because most kids in this age range are highly active. And it's very important that we encourage our kids to be active as well. Again, childhood obesity um, is something that we've seen on the rise, particularly in the United States. And one way to combat that is to make sure that kids get at least an hour of physical exercise a day, getting them away from the uh, getting away from video games, television, um, you know, tablets, handheld devices. All of these are good ways to make sure that kids are getting the proper amount of physical activity they need. Of course, the amount of calories they need in their diet is directly related to how much exercise they're getting on a daily basis. With teeth becoming, uh, with teeth falling out and teeth coming in, one micronutrient that becomes very important at this age group is fluoride. Um, so the good news is if you're in the United States and you're on a municipal water supply, your water is fluoridated. However, if you are not um, on a municipal water supply that is fluoridated, it might be important to get fluoride supplements. A lot of times this can be done at the dentist um, with a fluoride rinse um, or a, a fluoride sort of gel uh, that the teeth are exposed to. And this can help to ensure that the teeth that do come in are healthy um, and have a nice um, healthy enamel on the surface that can prevent cavities. Of course, if cavities begin to arise, this becomes a whole other problem um, in terms of maintaining proper nutrition. One important thing to note about uh, nutrition in this particular uh, age group is what a child eats is highly dependent on a number of different factors. Yes, they're going to develop their own tastes for things that they like. Maybe they can avoid things. Maybe they will avoid things that have textures they don't appreciate or flavors they don't like, but they're also going to be looking at you. They quite often model their diet after their parents. If parents don't like certain things or parents say that certain things are yucky or don't taste good, then a child is much more likely not to eat that thing. They can also be influenced by their friends. They can be influenced by television and media. And one of the things to watch out for in terms of advertisements and commercials is there are a lot of foods that are geared towards children that are not healthy. Sugary drinks, soft drinks, uh, fruit juices, um, and snack foods that really aren't good for the child, but are marketed to look fun and good. And of course they taste good because they're sugary sweet, um, but making sure that kids also eat things like lean meats, fruits and vegetables is hugely important to making sure that uh, they don't suffer from childhood obesity and that they're getting the proper amount of micro and macronutrients in their diet. Again, um, taking uh, a vitamin supplement is something that many children do to make sure that they're getting the proper amount of vitamins and minerals in their diet. Unfortunately, maintaining proper nutrition isn't something that is always possible. About 20% of children in the United States live in a home that is food insecure. In other words, um, there is a significant chance on any given day that that child may not have access uh, to a sufficient amount of food or any food at all. 
Now, there are some programs in place to help combat that. For example, the National School Lunch Program um, seeks to provide federal funding to public school districts to ensure that they are able to feed kids uh, lunch and sometimes breakfast um, at low or no cost to the students to ensure that they're at least getting um, a meal or two a day that is meeting specific guidelines as outlined um, as outlined by the FDA. Between the ages of 8 and 12, we reach early adolescence or the preteen years. And this is where the onset of puberty is going to begin. Um, this usually happens in two stages. The first stage, um, children typically grow um, somewhere between 10 and 25 percent in terms of height. Um, they, they grow very, they, they put on a lot of height. Um, this often results in sort of a very lean appearance where they're very tall, but also kind of thin. Um, but then in the second half of this, their, their weight is going to increase. They sort of, um, how, how some people say, they start to fill out um, and they begin to put on muscle mass um, and they begin to add weight to sort of fill in um, their body that has now grown um, significantly in terms of their height. Um, during this time period, uh, the, the nutritional requirements are going to still remain roughly the same, 45 to 65% carbohydrates, 10 to 30% protein, um, and then 25 to 35% um, with fats. That's what we prefer um, as part of their diet. They're going to need somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 calories. Um, again, a lot of that is tied to how active they are. The more active a child is, the more calories they're going to need in their diet. The less active they are, the fewer calories they're going to need in their diet. During this time period, micronutrients such as vitamin D, calcium, uh, vitamin K, vitamin B12, and iron become increasingly important. Obviously, vitamin D and calcium are hugely important as the skeleton is growing and that process of of ossification is still happening. Um, iron is important uh, for two different reasons. For young women, it's because menstruation is going to begin during this time period typically. And for young men, um, this is actually going to be important for developing lean muscle that they're going to start putting on as they um, fill out and as they put on that weight towards the end, which is often at least at this age, typically in the form of lean muscle. So as we reach the teenage years, we head into late adolescence. This typically is considered to last up until about the age of 18. Um, at this part, uh, a, a lot of different changes are happening uh, physically. So obviously, they're continuing to grow. Uh, young women will continue to grow typically until they're about 16 years old. Um, young men until they reach the ages of 18 or 20. During this time period, women typically need somewhere between uh, 1,800 and 2,400 calories. Um, men may need upwards of 3,200 calories. And again, a lot of this is tied to how much physical activity um, they undergo. So at this point, uh, a lot of, of teenagers participate in um, sports, athletics. Uh, those, those, those individuals are going to need significantly more calories uh, than teenagers who live a more sedentary lifestyle. Um, and all of this is coupled with, uh, with a lot of different types of development, both physical uh, and emotional. Um, Obviously, the teenage years can be a tricky time in terms of emotional development um, and physical development as well. Um, and what often happens is uh, teenagers become increasingly more independent. They're going to be left to their own devices and, and be able to make their own nutritional decisions. Unfortunately, sometimes what happens is they make poor decisions. And uh, what's really hard to do but important is try to steer teenagers away from things like fast foods, uh, sugary things. And this becomes even more difficult as their schedules become more crowded uh, between school and athletics and extracurricular activities, um, as well as a social life. And, uh, you know, it can be more challenging. It's very important during this time period, though, that the calories that they need, the calories they're getting are healthy fruits, vegetables, uh, nutrient dense things. Unfortunately, all too often we can see that um, these caloric demands are filled by other things, uh, fast food, junk food, things like that. Um, and it seems to be sort of part of the course of, of development for almost all American teenagers at this point. One thing to watch out for during this time period is uh, this is a period in which um, uh, eating disorders often develop. So uh, three of the big ones um, are anorexia, um, bulimia, and binge eating disorders. So with anorexia, the uh, people become obsessed with dieting and they don't consume enough food. And uh, this is a potentially fatal condition that people die from. Um, and it afflicts, uh, it, it afflicts both men and women uh, where they simply don't eat enough and um, they can actually die or suffer from other health-related issues from lack of proper nutrition. Uh, binge eating disorders occur when people go through periods where 
um, they just binge eat. In other words, they just consume uh, thousands and thousands of calories and then um, they stop and then they binge again. Um, this is actually a condition that can cause um, problems in terms of obesity. Uh, so a binge eating disorder um, can result in someone uh, gaining massive amounts of weight simply because they go through short bursts of eating way too much um, and then they don't aren't able to uh, sort of get rid of those calories and uh, they end up gaining weight. So this is where things like um, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular problems, and other problems associated with obesity can occur. Bulimia um, is similar to a binge eating disorder, but um, what often happens is sort of the cycle of binging and purging. So they'll eat too much, and then after eating, there's some sort of uh, habitual behavior that occurs afterwards, whether it's vomiting um, or the use of diuretics to shed the water weight or uh, other things that might cause them to um, try to, you know, essentially they eat and then they try to find ways to get rid of the calories or get rid of the food that they consume. Um, all three of these become increasingly common, unfortunately, during the teenage years, um, and all three of them can have very profound negative effects on the health of the people who suffer from them. During this time period, it is very important for parents to encourage their children to have a uh, a diet that's rich in variety that is rich in the healthy foods that they need. You don't want to put your child on at this. You don't want to put your child on an overly restrictive diet because um, they could be missing out on certain nutrients they need. Uh, but it's also important to encourage them to eat healthy and not just let them eat things like junk foods and um, empty calorie foods because um, they could end up becoming obese at this stage. And uh, the other thing to keep in mind is all of the decisions, all these choices that they're learning to make um, during their during their early adolescence and late adolescence. These are building up the types of behaviors. Um, and, and, and habits that they're going to be carrying on later on into adulthood. So once you reach age 19, so the period from 19 to 30 is generally considered to be uh, young adulthood. So this is when you're generally, generally regarded to be in your peak physical form. Uh, this is when typically lean muscle mass is the highest and by pretty much every metric, um, your body's about as good as it's gonna get. You've reached your full mature adult size, Typically, your muscle to fat ratio is as good as it's going to get. Um, you know, incidences of, of, of muscle problems, joint problems are very, very low at this age group. And uh, if you look at what your nutritional demands are during uh, young adulthood, they're not significantly different from that when you were in uh, your late adolescence. So uh, men typically getting uh, needing calorie caloric consumption somewhere between 2,200 and 3,000 calories, and women 18 to like 2,500. And again, a lot of that is linked to physical activity. And because your body's in the best physical shape it's probably ever going to be, getting the required amount of physical activity typically is not that hard. Uh, what you will start to notice towards the end of young adulthood, um, as you get into your late 20s, is you may start to notice um, some changes. Typically in your mid to late 20s is where um, things such as high cholesterol, high blood pressure might start to manifest themselves. Um, that's why getting the proper amount of soluble fiber and insoluble fiber can be uh, very helpful. So soluble fiber will help to get cholesterol down. Insoluble fiber can help to maintain bowel regularity um, and save off things like instances of colon polyps and colon cancer. So uh, towards your late 20s is when you start might start to see some of these things. So maintaining a proper diet during that period can be hugely helpful to sort of staving off those problems or preventing them from forming in the first place. As you get to your late 20s and early 30s, you're going to start to see more of those early symptoms of aging, uh, but these are going to begin to manifest a little bit more when you get into middle age. So once you hit 31, you are considered to be middle age. So ages 31 to 50 are considered to be middle age. So um, I was shocked to find um, when I was looking at the information that I was presenting to you that I'm not only middle-aged, I'm well into middle age at this point. Um, so that is a funny feeling to realize all of a sudden I am middle-aged. Um, but it's not all bad. Uh, so in middle age, um, you start to see this first overt signs of aging. You're going to see wrinkles uh, where you didn't uh, see them before. Your skin is going to be uh, maybe not as great as it used to be. Uh, your hair might start to fall out if it already hasn't started to. Um, other things that start happening, you start to get aches and pains where you didn't used to in your joints. So, you know, if you were an athlete in your younger days, maybe your knees or your back might start to bother you more than it used to. 
all those things you basically started hearing your parents complain about when you were kids, you start complaining about those things. And that's kind of what middle age is like. And the reason why is um, you're sort of on sort of the physical decline once you hit that point in your life cycle. So as you progress through middle age, one of the things you'll note is the amount of calories that you need drops uh, dramatically. People don't typically need upwards of 3,000 calories. We start to get more down into the 1,800 to 2,200 calorie range. Again, a lot of this is tied to how how active you are. Uh, the more active you are, the more calories that you'll need on a daily basis. The less active you are, um, the fewer calories you will need. Towards the end of middle age, um, some changes are going to occur, particularly in women. Uh, one of those, uh, typically in your late 40s, early 50s, is the onset of menopause. So this is the end of the uh, menstruation period where women no, will no longer menstruate. Uh, this is concomitant with a host of hormonal changes um, that can dramatically alter the way uh, a woman's body behaves at this point. Um, and consequently, there are some recommendations in terms of changing your diet to help uh, control some of the more physical manifestations of this menopause process. For example, those hormonal changes can lead to things like loss of bone mass, which means uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements might become more and more important. Um, avoiding things that are high in caffeine, high in sodium, um, or spicy foods can actually help to uh, decrease the, the hot flashes that may uh, result as part of the menopause process. And as a result, uh, women's bodies are going to change quite significantly towards the end of middle age as we get into uh, our senior years. Once you hit age 51, nutritionally, you are, to, you are considered to be an older adult. Some people refer to these as your golden years. Um, and at this point, we start to see advanced stages of aging begin to occur. Joint problems become more severe. Uh, skin becomes thinner and harder to repair. Uh, muscles start to, you start to lose muscle mass. And you may also start to lose bone mass uh, during this process. As a result, um, vitamins such as vitamin D um, uh, and vitamin B6, calcium, uh, become much more important to maintaining uh, proper body functions. Uh, caloric needs tend to be significantly less because as you get over your, into your 50s, you typically become significantly less active. And one of the things that can happen um, is that you start to put on much more weight because you don't change your diet, but your body's nutritional needs have gone down dramatically. Um, it's very common for people to begin gaining weight in their, in their middle torso. So basically you start getting a gut as a result of eating too many calories and that's where your body typically chooses to store that fat. All of these can lead to a host of age-related problems. Uh, once we get over 50, the risks for developing things such as diabetes, cancer, high cholesterol, and other heart problems um, become significantly, uh, significantly higher uh, in, in these age groups. As you uh, get increasingly older, maintaining proper nutrition becomes more and more important and becomes more and more directly related to uh, health span and lifespan. A poor diet later in life can cause a host of problems and it can exacerbate other underlying conditions that may not otherwise be a problem or be minor problems. So making sure you're still getting a proper amount of nutrition is important. This does become harder for several reasons. First and foremost, um, it's possible that um, you may start to develop dental problems later in your life um, and, and this can make it harder to eat certain foods. It's also uh, one of the things that happens is your senses actually start to become dulled. Um, we're all familiar with the fact that you tend to have vision problems and hearing problems as you get older, but you also start to lose your taste of your, your sense of taste, uh, which means foods that you once enjoyed you may no longer enjoy, or food just may not taste good at all for you. And some people actually um, develop a swallowing condition called dysphagia, uh, where it becomes harder to swallow foods. And as a result, um, a lot of older people they just don't eat much anymore, and they can actually. Um, almost develop a, an anorexia-like condition where they simply don't eat enough because food just doesn't taste good or it's just too hard to eat um, at that point. At the same time, digestive problems become more and more frequent, um, so your body isn't taking the same amount of nutrition as it did from the food uh, that you did in the first place. As a result, it's become more and more uncommon in the United States for uh, people that are over 50 years old to work with doctors and work with trainers, for example, to maintain a proper balance of getting exercise so that they're able to sort of prevent obesity without losing too much of the muscle and, and bone mass that they need in order to remain healthy. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today we talked about um, lifespan nutrition. So we talked about uh, how our nutrition and our diet needs to change 
um, from birth all the way up through uh, old age and seeing why those nutritional requirements do change and how they're important for our health. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot and I look forward to seeing you at one of my future videos. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.